Well, it ain't a diamond back, but still. You never want to come up on a snake that you didn't see until you're about two feet away. <laughs> oh, man. That's how we started our morning walk. All right. Keep moving along, Snakey. Keep moving along. Just stay out of my way. I'll stay out of yours. The mornings start slow and um, peacefully and gradually, and I appreciate them. It's hard to get going first thing, just jumping up and, um, and it, you know, it dawned on me, I was writing in my journal the other day, or the other week actually, but um, the language struck me a couple of weeks ago when I thought about how myself for years and years and years, and I'm sure countless others, <laughs> we wake up to an alarm. That never struck me, that word, in, until it just it really struck me as an epiphany the other week. And how just that thinking, that use of language, that perception that that instills, right? We wake up to an alarm. Wow. I wake up to these wind chimes. <laughs> And it makes all the difference in the world. I wake up with the sun or the heat. And um, so does everything else. The unnaturalness of um, being alarmed first thing upon waking up. What programming over the years does that instill and how deeply, huh? Yeah. So I'm no longer alarmed when I wake up. <laughs> and not only that, it's not just the clock. It's the multiple alarms. The alarms on our cars, the alarms on our houses, the alarm in our mind of fearing worst case scenario, catastrophizing. From the moment we wake up, literally, from the moment we wake up, and then it just sort of can, you know, continues on. It, you know, if you're online or whatever, and your house is sort of, you know, alarmed, yeah, that could go off at any time as well. And we just have that thinking in place. The alarms will go off. <laughs> and like a Pavlovian dog, you know, we have to react to it. Wow, that's some deep programming. That's some deep, deep programming right there, yeah? <laughs> the water is precious. I'm so grateful to have a well and um, can't imagine how anybody can do any kind of living out here in the day. <laughs> it's so dry without a well or a water source of some kind. I mean, some people, a lot of people apparently, they go to the, they have to rely on these community wells, you know, they have to go get their water. Um, so... Yeah, you can never take it for granted. So I even condition the soil using mulch and a lot of watering, letting the biodiversity sort of take action. And that's what happens. I mean, the insects come, the butterflies, the birds. You just set it in motion, you know. you. you Obviously, water is the most precious and valuable agent of change. 
it activates everything. And you just see it as soon as the well got put in and I, I began planting things. Um, all of the insects and all of the uh, biodiversity of the area came around. Not always in a good way. Right there is where I found a, uh, <laughs> a rattlesnake crawling around and I haven't seen it since, but you just never know. I saw a snake this morning on the road. Um, anyway, so that's my watering chore this morning that I'd share. So uh, I'm making this mud, <coughs> excuse me, this mud pit right here. This is sort of an unintended consequence, but I'm loving the idea. Normally I mix up cob in the little kiddie pool, transfer over by wheelbarrow. And I was realizing I'm doing this berm anyway, it's right here. And uh, I actually dumped the kiddie pool in this little area that I dug out the other day. And uh, I'm like, hey, this is going to be my cob. So this entire berm here, this slope, is going to be um, packed with mud and straw, just like cob. Well, it is cob. So <laughs> that was not intentional, but I'll take it. And I'll show you. When you're making cob, you got to get your shoes off. And uh, you got to get at it. But the payoff is the coolness of this mud is just extraordinary. And it feels so good on the feet. So uh, I didn't even intend to do this to do today, to tell you the truth. It was just complete. I dumped the kiddie pool out. And uh, why waste the good mud? So here we are. Anyway, time to do some work with it. It's a little too wet, but that's okay. You kind of ball it up, slap it on. Ancient technology. You know how many houses, buildings, all kinds of structures are still standing? after hundreds if not thousands of years that are made of mud and we're building with wood and bullshit synthetic code enforced materials that are completely unhealthy unnatural even toxic right and you have to have a permit to build that way ridiculous ridiculous how far we've evolved? I don't think so. That's de evolution right there. Well, shit, I can't turn off the goddamn camera. Well, I will uh, attempt with my muddy hands to do that right now. Sorry, camera. Um, and then I'll show you uh, the progress. Um, when I when I accomplish it. All right. All right. So the mud is on the berm, and it's holding the uh, wire mesh in place. And um, that's just one layer. But yeah, this was a this was a fine idea. So what I'm doing here with this area of the pool is just tamping it down, making sure that any rocks are pushed down into the clay and it'll make it smooth when I put the, the uh, pond liner down you know and really I'm gonna still put one down just be sure but um, 
you don't even need a pond liner, liner if you if you do this correctly. This cob is is going to set up very strong like concrete. But I'm going to, you know, I mean that's the ancient way, you know, just clay cisterns. But um, I have a pond liner. I intend to use it. We'll see how it goes. So here's the hot tip that um, marathoners know. And uh, even if they don't employ it, they know of it. It's called the Galloway Method. Jeff Galloway was a famous runner back in the day in the 70s and, uh, and 80s. And I mean, probably still running to this day. I haven't kept up with him or his career. But um, yeah, he published a very famous running book. And in it described this whole methodology. And basically, when I first heard, you know, I was running a marathon and I saw these guys ahead of me and they were keeping this pace. Um, but then they were increasing their pace as the race went on. So it was working. They were, they were stretching out their distance and I was trying to sort of keep up to see if my pacing was more steady than their pacing. And what they were doing was, according to their watches, they were um, doing the Galloway method, which is you ratio your time, uh, whatever that is. You can run six minutes and then walk a minute or you can, you can slice it any which way you want. When I was coaching, uh, you know, marathon running, um, I would always tell people, try it. You know what I mean? I've seen it work. I did it. Um, and I still think about it. So when I'm working on these projects, um, in this heat or whatever, I'm doing the Galloway method, right? So I'm doing some hard digging, um, in the hot sun. Uh, and I'll just, you know, I don't even have a watch on. It's just sort of a biological in my head. Um, I'm going to do intervals, you know, um, whether it's uh, work twice as long and then take a half of that time uh, as a rest, or you could even do a one-to-one, -one, you know, one minute on, one minute off, gather your breath and, um, and then go back at it. You'll be surprised how it um, increases your stamina. And it's it's an amazing thing to, um, to to know about at least even if you don't if you don't use it all the time it's something that's so ingrained in me now that I just do it naturally so when I was thinking about it, when I was digging just now I thought I'd share that with you. So one thing I forgot to mention was when you're making cob, um, you got to test your soil and see what the composition is. This one ha is heavy uh, on clay, of course, and um, you need to have about 60 to 70 percent sand in your cob mixture. So I add sand. I forgot to mention that before. It's important. And then along with the sand, you got to mix in your straw. I don't know the percentage. I kind of just go on feel and you know what the consistency is, but it's the binding agent really to the cob. So it's pretty simple. You got clay, you got sand, you got straw, you got water. And then you get in. And that's what's nice about doing this on 100 degree days. You get in with your feet. And you mix, and you mix, and you mix, and you mix. And it feels so freaking good. So you'll... that's the payoff working with cob is that you get the nice, cool mud on your feet, and that cools your core.
As I've been working on this, I had every intention of putting a pond liner down, and then, I don't know, I just started, I kept connecting with the mud and the process, and it just reminds me of, you know, ancient technology of, you know, the Romans and, you know, all the civilizations that used, that didn't have rubber and, you know, these, these manufactured materials. This is the way that they did it. So I'm gonna find a way to waterproof this, but I think that just the, the sculpting process of it all and just the connection. When you get in here, especially with your feet and your hands and you're working with the earth, um, you wanna keep that consistent and that connection is, is very strong. So it's, it's the connection, it's that connection that's, um, that's driving me or teaching me really the, the process that I, that I should be doing. So even though I have this palm liner, you know, that rubber, that layer of rubber would just completely separate that connection to the earth, you know, when you get into this pool. And I think it charges the water as well. I know it does because the Romans in building their aqueducts and their city systems of, of you know, fountains and whatever, um, you know, they didn't use any rubber or, you know, PVC pipes or anything like that. And the water, when you drink it, is just some, there's something to it. It's charged. So when it gets to be midday, I've got to come inside to some shade. But I want to keep working. So what I'm doing now is between the uh, working on the cistern and digging and mudding that whole area right there, um, I'm making my um, bottle walls. So first I've got to take my bottles my tile saw and uh in half and then make a brick out of them and that's solid insulation and then you embed them in the cob and you get these beautiful sort of stained glass effects so cutting my bottles making the bottle bricks and then I'll show you when I um, actually start embedding them into the walls which I've done a few already, but I'll show you more.